right, Please. guys. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Nice to see you guys at Lab Code Agents. I'm Vanessa Noble out of Anchorage, Alaska, and I'm here for another investment series with Patrick Capwell <laughs> out of San Diego. He's an agent with Compass out of the San Diego market, and um, I've introed him before to you. He's now like a third time webinar guest, and he is a Naval Academy grad, uh, has a master's in real estate as well. Oh, and is it MBA in real estate or MBA in finance or both? both? MBA in finance and a master's degree in real estate from awesome. USD and UCLA. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, you know, definitely someone with that has invested a lot of time. You know, a lot of us um, being real estate entrepreneurs, we're like, we don't need education. Uh, but the value of dedicating so much time studying the, the elements that support um, real estate investing and real just real estate con the consumption of real estate right buying and selling um, when I interview agents across the country one of the, the big huge questions that I struggle with when I ask agents is um, and we already have some questions here so I might look at the chat um, but some of the questions that um, uh, yes, these webinars are being recorded. Uh, and I, last, last week I got that question five times. Uh, and so, <laughs> yes, 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 they're being recorded. But as I interview agents across the country, for those of you who don't know, um, I am with an organization called Active Duty Passive Income, and I run our, um, our referral, uh, network of agents but we don't just pick any agents we are very selective with the agents that we choose to incorporate into the network because they have to have this investment knowledge set as we help veterans build wealth through real estate and so um but as i interview agents across the country um my, the biggest problem that i have um when i ask just a random question patrick i ask people regularly um I say, what would what advice would you give a buyer in your market? And then I always get, what type of buyer? Like a regular residential buyer or like an investor? Because they know well, like I have an investor like platform, right? And so, um, and I'm like, well, how about any buyer is an investor? Any buyer is an investor. We're not selling shoes. We are selling an asset and this asset could 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 be a huge detriment. I would say a real estate is either a stepping stone or a stumbling block. You screw up with what you buy or you're intentional about what you buy. Or And sometimes people get lucky and then they're like, real estate is great. I made $70,000. They didn't do it on purpose, right? It just happened and they don't know why. Um, and so when I came from being an intel analyst in the military into real estate, what I realized very quickly, because I was very fearful of investing in real estate, a lot of the same you know misconceptions that so many people have. Um, and when I came into real estate and I was like, wait a minute, everything is like on trends. And there's like a lot of data, historical data to support. And there's a lot of economic factors that influence things. And this is not as, as like unpredictable as people think. You can be very intentional, which is very important to military families. So, you know, having that investment lens is so, so valuable. And the lens that Patrick comes from, which I'm excited to talk about, um, because we are going to be uh, talking about this whole, the whole last series is how to really calculate your ROI. And what Patrick is going to share today is the way that passive income can make you wealthier faster than, uh, excuse me, negative cash flow can make you po uh, wealthier faster <coughs> And positive cash flow and that is sometimes hard to like conceptualize mm -hmm. and I'm gonna well we'll we'll make this a discussion because we'll talk about the different times that this is doable the times that it's not doable um, and how this negative cash flow works and in what markets because it's not in every market so let's go yeah and Vanessa uh, you said a couple of things that I think are definitely worth emphasizing you said every buyer is an investor to some extent, even if they're just buying a house, that is likely going to be the largest asset and the highest, val most valuable asset they have the day they die 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 years from now. And That's it's an also, investment. it's also like the biggest liability, especially it's like a single door is the biggest liability that you can own 
if, if you're not doing it intentionally because there's a hundred percent liability on that one mortgage. Right. And so, mm -hmm. but between multifamily and single family, single family can be super risky. So when people are like, Oh, you're just buying a single family home. Like, yeah, that's the riskiest asset. What happens if you lose your job and you end up in foreclosure? You know what I mean? I mean, well, it's so, it's okay. and, you know, I'm working with some buyers right now thinking about that because we are in a recession. They're like, isn't a house a huge liability? And then my question is, isn't your rent a huge liability? <laughs> like, are you, do, or is your goal to live in a box and push a shopping cart? Or are you going to be paying either rent or a mortgage? Yeah, but what if I can't make my rent? I can just move in with a friend. Yeah, and if you can't make a mortgage, you have your friend move in with you. Um, so who do you want to be? The friend that's sleeping on the couch or the one who's got a friend on the couch? Um, <laughs> like, I think the biggest liability is paying rent because you get no equity, you get no tax write-offs, you get no appreciation, you get nada. But with home ownership, you at least get all of those benefits of financial growth. Um, is a mortgage a liability? Eh. Um, a car payment is, a credit card payment is, uh, a mortgage, yes, to some extent, it definitely is. But I would rather own than rent. Uh, I think you, most on this podcast or webcast would probably agree with Well, that. and, you know, the crazy thing is, is that when we talk about the net worth, right, the net worth of people, and you see this, you see, they're saying I'm cutting in and out. Am I still cutting in and out? Not for um, me. You, Not for you me. You see this... Um, this diagram when, when a lot of us will have seminars, home buying seminars on this, you know, the net worth of a renter versus the net worth of a buyer. And we oh. talk about net worth and it's like this like concept that we, that we like not everybody actually understands, right? Um, I'm actually teaching my virtual assistant because I've been on the Ben Kinney um, Wealth Series and Investment Series. So I'm uh, having my virtual assistant start to calculate my net worth because I just know that I won't put the personal effort into calculating numbers every, every month. Uh, so my VA, he has a degree in accounting. He's going to be um, calculating my net worth for me so I can watch my tracker. But There's a great website called Personal Capital, and you can go on there, plug in all your bank accounts, your mortgages, your car payments, the value of your car, the value of your house, and this net worth uh, uh, personal capital website calculates your net worth for you. Oh, gosh. Personalcapital.com. Personalcapital.com. Mm -hmm. I'm going to text this to my friend Ben now. Yeah. They did awesome. not pay me or ask me to even say that. I just know of them there. It's a good website. Awesome. <clears throat> and so what Patrick is going to talk about with this negative cash flow, it doesn't work for everyone always in the beginning. Okay. But he's going to talk about this amazing concept. So if you were on with us last week, we talked about K and Patrick calculated K and where K comes from. So that's kind of the preface of what we're talking about. We did a whole thing on, on um, K, which is a constant variable in finance that you have to uh, accept, understand it's like gravity, it's a law. And so um, you kind of have to understand that that is, so if you're gonna use a lot of this invest, investment knowledge and you know um, research, um, an analysis, you have to use K as part of your variable when you're making these calculations. So go ahead and let's, let's jump. Yeah. In. And I would recommend anyone who hasn't watched last week's uh, to jump on and see that recording because today is going to kind of tie into that. Um, if you haven't watched last week's, don't worry, you'll still be able to follow along today. Um, but it would be enhancing to last, uh, watch last week's. And, you know, Vanessa quote that I read this morning, you made me think of as well. Uh, there's two things you said that like, got my mind and that's the education um a quote from jim Rohn that i just read this morning jim Rohn. is a f what's that yeah a formal education can make you a living self-education can make you wealthy and that goes to speak to you know the the people the 40 plus participants i see on today and all those that'll watch this is self-education and i have made my, most of my success through self-education, self-study, I'm sure you could say the same, Vanessa. So formal education is great, but you got to keep on learning. Um, and today, as Vanessa mentioned, we're going to talk about negative cash flow. The, the, like, the key word out there, the hype word, the, the glitter is this word called positive cash flow. Everyone's looking for positive cash flow, positive cash flow, positive cash flow. I'm here to tell you today that negative cash flow not only can, but almost certainly will make you wealthier, faster than positive cash flow. 
and I'm going to show you the numbers why. And um, you know, really quick, um, yeah. when, when I'm helping even someone buy a single family home, okay, and, and our market is very strong, and I talk to them about the trends, the up and down trends of, um, of, of the rental market. And so sometimes it's kind of, it's pretty steady. They're not going to ever be super negative, but sometimes when, if a mortgage is 2000 and then the rental market is at 1800, but on the high side, it's at 23, right? So, so we have the, the sine wave, right? And so in certain cycles, they'll be underwater about $200 or positive about $300, right? To their mortgage. But even just in the most basic, basic, and you're going to get so much deeper than that, here, but even the most basic level, like uh, using the simplest numbers, if they were to put two, if they're negative cash flow, $200 every single month, right? So that is $200 for 12 months. So $200 for 12 months is $2,400. But even in their appreciate, their equity position, not their appreciation, just their equity position, their pay down residual, um, they've paid off six thousand dollars for that year but they only invested twenty four hundred dollars that year into a six thousand dollar payoff on their equity position that's not even including appreciation which patrick is going to calculate there's still dollar for dollar return on that losing asset like you know over a dollar for dollar because three thousand dollars would be a dollar for dollar return you know on that negative equity so excuse me on that negative um you know they were out of pocket two hundred dollars a month and so even when I tell them you're still positive for an investment vehicle, even when you're losing on an asset, right? And so that's Absolutely. what you're going to, that's what you're going to expound on. Absolutely. And, and, and last night I did a webinar uh, for first time home buyers looking at the first time home for this today. We're going to do it looking at an investment property. Um, again, a, as an investor, you need to understand so much more beyond the cash flow. And what blows my mind is most people, do invest in appreciating assets, not cash flow assets. Most people don't look at cash flow that much when they invest, except for one asset, and that's real estate. And it really blows my mind. Like, I'm oh, sure you're a lot right. of- You're right, like, so if I go buy like a car, I wanna know like, how much does it increase in value if I'm gonna buy this antique vehicle or something? Antique vehicle, yeah. And I, I would use maybe a good example would be like a 401k. Like okay, I'm going to, uh, this year, I think you can put like 19,500 into a 401k. Um, you put around 6,000 into an IRA. So let's say I put $19,000 into my 401k today. Is that a cash? Is that a negative cash flow? Yes, it is. It's cash flow going from my checking account into my brokerage account that I cannot touch until I'm uh, 59 and a half. 60 years old. I can't touch that money. Then when I'm 59 and a half years old and I start pulling that money out of that investment vehicle, the 401k, my goal and hope is that it's worth more and has grown more tax deferred. And I can now pull out a greater amount of money than what I put into it. But that's negative cash flow coming out of my checking account. So many people focus on their, what we call in finance, their cash flow statement. And what we should really focus on is our balance sheet. And you alluded to the balance sheet, Vanessa, when you were talking about net worth and you're hiring someone to calculate your net worth. Your net worth is how much money do you have in your checking account, your savings account, your retirement accounts? How much equity do you have in your real estate? What's the value of your car? Do you have any collectibles? What's the value of the food in your pantry? What's the value of everything you own Subtract from that your liabilities, your debts. The value of everything you own minus your debts, that is your net worth, okay? Your net worth can go up even though your cash flow is going down. How is that? Because a lot of these assets I just mentioned, uh, all these items from your car in the driveway um, that's a bad example because that's probably going to depreciate. Right. But and I meant, I, meant like, I meant like collectible valuables. Like when I buy a painting, when I like, you know, if I'm going to buy a museum piece <clears> or my, my dad buys antique cars. So that's why that came to mind. Yes. But you know, it's like when he, when he buys any vehicle and he, he knows he's going to fix it up, he knows it's worth three times <clears> the value based on what it is. Right. So. 
Well, in art, the, the wealthiest of the wealthy collected art, not because they love art, but to shelter money, um, because you could go out and buy a $2 million Picasso and sit on it for five to 10 years. Now it's worth $4 million. Picasso. Yeah, and, and, and let's say you sit on it for 10 years and it's worth $3 million. Well, I bought it for $2 million. That's a $2 million cash outflow, right? But it went into an asset. It's in that Picasso that's worth $2 million. And I got to pay... $5,000 a year for storage and insurance and all this other stuff, right? How much is that Picasso making me? Zero, nada, zilch. Um, and I'm paying $5,000 a year to protect it, but it's going up in value, say $100,000 a year. So if I'm paying 5,000 a year to store it and it's going up in value 100,000 a year, I'm negative cash flowing 5,000 a year but it's going up in value 100K a year. So that means my net worth is going up $95,000 a year, right? And what am I doing? I'm just sitting back, taking a nap while I get $95,000 a year richer, doing nothing. Um, 10 years later, it's worth a million dollars more. It's worth 3 million. What can I do? Tax code 1031 exchange. I can section 1031 of the tax code. You can go out and do a 1031 exchange, sell the Picasso for $3 million. I bought it for two. So I just made a million dollars. I have to pay long-term capital gains tax on that. Um, and we talked about taxes in our last seminar. I'd definitely dive into that. Um, unless I don't have to pay, pay long-term capital gains tax, I pay no taxes if I use my gain to buy another piece of artwork. So I, go, so I go out and I buy a Da Vinci. I go buy Leonardo Da Vinci for four million because I just made a million bucks, 25% down payment. Let's buy that four million Da Vinci. Now that Da Vinci's costing me $10,000 a year to, 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 to maintain, to secure, to put in a safe, um, to get insured, $10,000 a year, I'm negative cash. But that Da Vinci's going up $150K a year. So how much is my net worth going up per year? $140K. Now that, ten, that scenario I just told you, you can do that with real estate as we know. But the 1031 exchange that I talked about, selling artwork tax-free, that went away with the new tax code. The new tax code that the Republican Congress passed, the ability to 1031 real uh, artwork in just about anything went away, but they kept it for one thing. Guess what that is? Real estate. Obviously. Real estate. The only thing you can still 1031 exchange is real estate. Go figure. It's a real estate guy in office. Um, so what <laughs> happened to all the auction houses? A lot of the art auction houses shut down after the new tax code got paid because real estate became less of a favorable tax shelter than, or excuse me, artwork became less of a favorable ta uh, tax shelter compared to real estate, okay? So that's, that's an example verbally comparing it to artwork, but let's dive into the numbers in an Excel spreadsheet because I always like to say people can lie, but numbers don't. So let's look at the numbers. Is that cool? Yep. All right, I'm going to share my screen for this portion. <clears throat> And here we go. Can you see this? Multifamily financial model? Yes, yes. So let's go over some Excel spreadsheets 101. If you're an investor out there, um, you probably love Excel I'll spreadsheets. What's that? Or want to be. <clears throat> or if you want to be an investor, learn to love Excel spreadsheets. Um, this one, you see a lot of blue and then you see some white. Anything in blue is hard keyed in. Let's look at this example right hard here. Uh, typed in, hard keyed, I type it oh, in. Hard keyed, okay. Yep, so like here, the square feet. You can see up here, 768, I typed that in, in this cell, which is G12. In this cell, which is cell G15, we see up here, that's a formula. So in Excel spreadsheets, whenever you see blue, that's something that the user has to type in. And sometimes it'll be highlighted in the back in blue. Sometimes uh, it'll all be white, but the, the numbers will be typed in blue. Um, anything in white has a formula behind it, so you don't want to mess with that. You don't want to mess with white cells. It's all auto calculations. <clears throat> what we're, we're looking at right now, Vanessa, is a multifamily financial model for a triplex. This specific triplex is an Imperial Beach close to the beach. $1.1 million sales price, okay? Um, so I type that in here in blue. That's all I gotta do, everything else auto-calculate. 
Um, each unit, a three bed, one bath, they're renting for 2,400 a month. That's the current rent, that's the market rent. And this is a real example that a client of mine purchased a couple of years ago in San Diego. Any questions thus far? No. All right, I'm gonna change the size of this. You can see it a little better. Now, when it comes to underwriting a property that you're going to purchase, um, you want to separate your expenses from your revenues. And we see up here in the top right, this is our revenue. Down below, we're going to see our expenses, which I label as OPEX. And we learned in our last uh, webinar that we did that OPEX is just short for operating expenses. Remember that, Vanessa, last week? So in our operating expenses, we're going to break them out monthly um, or actually annually by unit. Annually by unit. You have your trash, your water, your legal, your repairs. If you want to add any in, you most definitely can. This particular property, I put 0% management fee because the client, the buyer, was going to manage this triplex themselves. If you're going to have someone else manage it, you could type in 6 or 8%, whatever it is that they're charging. The real estate taxes right here are 1.25% of the purchase price of the property. Um, your property insurance, $400 a unit, $1,200 total for the building. If there's any other expense that is a portion of your effective gross income, you put in here. Um, so here's all of our expenses, and then we got to be realistic. Can you explain, any question? Can you explain effective gross income? Yeah, effective gross income, and I show it right over here as well, is simply your gross income, your rent minus your vacancies. Rent minus vacancies is your effective gross income. So, so do you, you calculate that, you don't project that, you calculate that after the fact. Correct, yep, and we'll get that into the cal calculation here in a minute. Okay. Um, and we can backtrack to the expenses here if you'd like once we go through the calculations. <clears throat> so a couple underwriting assumptions. We know that inflation exists. So I like to put down that our rent is going to go up 3% year over year. For San Diego, that's very conservative. In San Diego, rent here often goes up 4 even 5% year over year. For vacancy, I like to factor in a 3% vacancy factor. You should know the vacancy rate in the market that you're buying in. Much of America has a 7% vacancy rate. In San Diego right now, we have a 2.9% vacancy rate. Um, which is effectively no vacancy because that just all allocates time for turnover in between tenants. And so um, how, and do, how do realtors find a <clears throat> in their market? You I need to uh, definitely research. Um, you can often find it with your local apartment association. Every, at least major city, is going to have a local apartment association that can provide you with that data. Your realtor association might be able to pr provide you with that data. And the government most certainly can provide you with that data. The government um, does this research. In San Diego, we get this data from SANDAG, the San Diego Association of Governments. <clears throat> does that answer your question, Vanessa? Yep. I just want to make sure everybody knows where to collect this information so that way as they're trying to create this, this knowledge set for them in their own market, that they know where to go. Mm -hmm. Yep. As you know with me, it's all about the data. you got to find the data, research it for your marketplace. Um, and then down here, expenses. We know that expenses are going to go up. Hey, if rent's going to go up, let's factor expenses going up 3% year over year as well. The other thing I like to add on down here in the bottom is replacements. We, you can call it a reserve account. You can call it a replacement account. But we all know that, hey, once every like 30 years, you got to replace the roof. Um, once every few years, you might need to replace an appliance within the unit. So I like to factor in at least $300 per unit per year. Um, and you can modify this perhaps based on the age of the property, the condition you're buying it in. If it's a brand new built building, you might not have to factor in as much. So any questions on expenses before we move on? Okay. <clears throat> All right, and I see people chatting. If anyone uh, in the chat, next Vanessa. Week, next week I told them we're gonna try to get us in for 90 minutes so that way we're not having a rush. <clears throat> these financial models because for people I really want people to understand this not just gloss over concepts. so um but you know I, I hate that we're you know so tight on time but 
Yeah, no, and I'll be able to get through all this in about 10, 20 minutes. Uh, okay, good. I think we're good on time. Yeah. So over here, this is now just our financing information. <clears throat> Purchase price, 1.1 million. You obviously have some closing costs. For this one, for the buyer, we factored in 1.5. And this specific buyer was doing 25% down. How did he come up with $275,000? Well, he did what we just discussed. He did one of those 1031 exchanges, Vanessa. And he actually sold a condo that he had owned in San Diego for about 10 to 15 years. And over that decade or so, he gained $275,000 equity, sold the condo, all the proceeds, instead of being taxed on them, he used them as a down payment on this triplex. Thus, he was able to buy this property essentially with no money down, no money out of his checking account. And he just rolled money from one property to another tax-free to buy a triplex. It's a great way. And that's why we say, hey, if you want to get into investing and you can't go buy that big multifamily deal, go buy a condo. And your appreciation in that condo 10, 15 years from now, you're going to use that uh, equity to go out and buy your multifamily. Right. Um, so I love what this guy did. And obviously, the rest of it was financed, 825K. <clears throat> now, down here, I have this model built. So you can have up to five investors. For this specific one, though, it was just, just this guy and his wife, just one investor. And why do you say you can have up to five? You're saying that you just calculate for people that are co-investing with you? That's right. And I could calculate in multiple uh, different people putting down, maybe five people each puts down 20% of the down payment instead of 100% of the down payment. And what exactly. loan products would they be using if five people <laughs> People You'd are. use the same type of loan. You just have more people on the loan and more people on the title. But the you loan that if I go out and buy a fourplex with me and my wife, um, we're going to use the same type of loan that you might use if it's you and your friend uh, or you and three friends. The only difference is the lender is going to have to underwrite all of you instead of just one of you. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I mean, certain loan types don't allow for unmarried or unrelated people to be on loans, but, but conventional. Yeah. And even, even like the VA loan, you can have an unmarried person on it, but on, the VA will only back a portion of it. So you're going to have to come in with a bigger down payment than zero. If you have like an unmarried domestic partner or something. Um, but, but getting back on, on track with this, this, for the financing, for this purchase, this guy was getting a 5% interest rate. So all we plug in down here is the interest rate. And uh, the term, it's a 30-year mortgage. Uh, we see right below that, it's broken down into our annual payment and our monthly mortgage payment is $4,429. Monthly mortgage payment, when you add the taxes and the insurance, it's 5,675. So you separate that? <clears throat> I separate that because taxes and an insurance are an operating expense. Some people impound those into an escrow account with their mortgage and they pay principal interest taxes and insurance all in one monthly payment. And some people pay their uh, insurance and their taxes outside of their mortgage payment. Um, and as you and I know, 30 years when your mortgage is paid off, you still have your taxes and insurance that you're paying. Um, right. So we definitely separate that out. And you see it over here is uh, taxes and insurance under our expenses. Um, what I like about this financial model in front of you is beyond just hey, saying, hey, it's a 5%, here's your, here's your payments. The second tab, we got all these tabs on the bottom and you can see like how dorky I am. I do 10 year net present value, 20 year net present value, investment analysis, 150K investment in the stock market versus real estate. We're not going to get into all those tabs today. Oh my God. That's why I just like calling you as a friend, friend project because I'm in San Diego. I'm going to spend the weekend at your house. <laughs> yeah, this is like stuff I do when I'm bored. I sit here and I build just different financial models to have fun. The financial model in front of you um, was uh, given to me by a friend and then I tweaked it and modified it for uh, my purposes. Um, down here on the second tab though, I will go into that. What I really like about this model is it shows us our amortization table because we all know as you make your monthly payment, um, your monthly payment stays the same, but your principal portion goes up and your um, interest portion goes down. So on this amortization table, here's our, our payment. To look at their amortization table. It's a great table to look at to kind of see how 
<clears throat> your net worth is going up, as we alluding back to what we discussed uh, 20 minutes ago. So here's your loan amount, your interest, 30 year loan, 12 payments a year. Total payment, including principal and interest is just over 4,400 a month. $991 is principal on payment one and 3,437 is interest on payment one. But as you see over here, month one, two, three, four, goes all the way down to month 360, 30 years, your principal payment goes up because you're paying down that loan balance. Your interest payment goes down because you're paying down that load balance. That principal payment, we must all be on the same page and understand what the principal payment is. That is not a cash outflow off of your balance sheet, your personal net worth balance sheet, Vanessa. That principal payment is a payment from your checking account into your equity. It is still on your personal net worth balance sheet though. Does that make sense? Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you, you still technically have it, even though from my bank account it's gone, it went into my my mortgage. Went into your uh, your equity my value. of your property, and you're right. It went into your mortgage to buy your mortgage down, so now you have less debt, and you that net worth did not leave you. Um, exactly correct. So it's important for even just a simple home buyer to understand this, let alone someone buying a 20 unit apartment complex. Right. The principal is not a cash outflow. It's a cash transfer from checking account to equity. Your interest payment on the other hand, certainly that's a cash outflow. Never going to see that money again. The great thing is though, this is a tax deduction. All these interest payments, tax deductions. <clears throat> so Let's go over here to our summary table now. We've got all of our inputs. All the inputs are done. Purchase price, the rents, the revenues, the expenses and the growth of those and the appreciation growth of your rents. And we've got your loan. All the inputs done. Now we just gotta look at our outputs. See how little blue there is here? Because these are all outputs. These are all auto calculations. Your one, two, three, four, all the way through five. Um, on the top here, and we're going to go to year two after a full year of operation. So let's look at year two. We've got our revenue, our rents on the top. We need to subtract this line, with, which is our vacancy. Remember, we're building in a 3% vacancy factor. And that gives us that number you asked about, effective gross income. It's just your potential rents minus vacancy is effective gross income. <clears throat> Next. We back out our property taxes. See, I'm doing that before the financing because property taxes are just always gonna be there no matter what type of financing you do. We also need to subtract our property insurance and we need to subtract our operating expenses. And those were things like your legal fees, your utility fees, your maintenance fees. And that gives us our total expenses. And from the last webinar that we did last week, we remember that your effective gross income minus your operating expenses gives you net operating income. Any questions so far, Vanessa? Or comments? <clears throat> None. So let's take <clears throat> our net operating income and subtract our reserve account. Remember, you got to replace the roof every 30 years or so. So we're backing out the reserves that we're setting aside, and that gives us your cash flow before debt service. Now comes the almighty mortgage. That mortgage is gonna take a big chunk out of it. If you cal do a calculation before the mortgage though, you calculate that cash flow before the mortgage, you divide it by your purchase price, that's gonna give you your cap rate, which we calculated in last week's se session as well. Your cap rate is just your net operating income divided by your purchase price. And as we see up here in the formula, that gave us a cap rate of 5.89%. We come down here though, and we subtract that debt payment. And for this mortgage, principal and interest, the client is paying a little over $53,000 a year. So 64,000 minus 53,000, he's making a little over $11,000 a year, which is 966 a month and his levered return also known as a cash on cash return. When people ask, what's your cash on cash return? Okay. That is simply this cash flow 
divided by the cash he invested. What was that cash he invested? Well, that's right back up here. Remember, $275,000. So when we take this 11,000 divided by that 275, we end up getting almost a 4% cash on cash. Does that make sense, Vanessa? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I would say I, I would not invest in any real estate for a 4% return. That's just crazy. Because you can get higher than a 4% return just putting your money in the stock market. But we have to remember there's a lot of layers to this onion of investment when it comes to real estate. First of all, going back to our amortization table, Remember this principal payment? It is not a cash outflow. It is a cash transfer from your checking account to your equity. It mm -hmm. becomes liquid to illiquid. Um, so we need to bake that back into the equation. To bake that back into the equation, we just take all those years on the amortization table, you see them right here in this formula bar, and we add them back in on this line item called principal payment. Once you bake in your principal payment, we see that uh, we add another 12,000. So his cash flow plus his principal payment adds up to actually 24,000 in year two, 21,000 in this year one. Why, this is why your MBA in finance, like, I'm like, because most people don't really remember all <clears throat> to refactor all of these values back into their chart. Even when I've dealt with a lot of different investors, uh, it's definitely not a, this 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 uh, thorough. You definitely, yeah, you definitely need to bake that back in. Otherwise, you are not seeing the full picture of how wealthy am I getting off this real estate investment. Um, you're looking at your principal payment as a cash outflow, and it's, you're losing it in your net worth. You would never buy real estate. Uh -huh. So we see our total return now is simply this number, 21,000, 24,000, 26. And why does it keep going up each year? Again, because your principal payment goes up each year and your rents are going up every year because rent goes up. We've all been renters before and we know rent goes up. So the real return for this client is now this, this 21, 24, $26,000 number divided by that, again, that initial cash outlay of 275K. Um, and when you divide that number, he's hitting returns around 8%. Now those are returns I would invest in. You can invest in the stock market and get like a seven, eight, nine percent return in the stock market. However, I would never ever invest in real estate for seven, eight or nine percent return if I'm using leverage, if I'm using a loan. If you're using a loan to invest in real estate, your return should be between 15 to 25 percent return the more of a loan you use, typically the higher return you're going to get. So how do we get that higher return? Well, another thing happens with real estate. What do you mean more of a the more of a loan you use, the, what do you mean? The, the, more, the, the larger the... the I'm, going to, I'm going to explain that with numbers here in a couple of minutes. Because okay. um, we're going to change the financing on this after we walk through it and we all understand this model. Then we're going to tweak just the financing. Um, so on this investment... Watch this again, Patrick. What's that? I'm going to watch this again. That's what you gave me that book. I, I hope you laughed when you gave me that book to read. And I'm like, okay, but do I need a master's in finance to consume this book? Or will I understand uh, how I need to read it? I got my daughter, daughter my 16-year-old daughter, reading a finance book right now, too. She's taking notes and everything on, on recipe cards uh, so she can quiz herself. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff to know. But this is like self-education, right? This is good. Um, so we got to this fact where total return on investments around 8%. But... Appreciation happens. Appreciation happens. Since the beginning of humans, appreciation of real estate has happened. Does it go up and down and up and down and up and down? I don't know what is going to happen to real estate in the next 30 days, but I can tell you what's going to happen to it in the next 10 years. It's going to be worth more than it's worth today. Why can I so confidently say that? Because there is no 10-year period in American history in which, Amer in which real estate is worth less 10 years from now than it was 10 years ago. You cannot go a 10-year span anywhere and find real estate worth less. It always You goes always up. use your, your community, <clears throat> your, your hometown as an example of depreciating real estate. So what do you mean by that? That's a, that's a good point. And I love you playing devil's advocate. Um, real estate always goes up when you have a growing market economically and population wise. 
Um, if you invest in a market that is shrinking population wise or is shrinking as far as um, uh, economically speaking, it will go down. Um, now, it might take 100 years to go up just because of inflation, but your goal in real estate is to invest in a market to just beat inflation, okay? Um, does that answer your question? Yes. You're right. You buy in a bad market and the value is going to go down, but right. you will be offset by ensuring, hopefully, if you do it right, that will be a higher cash flow market. If well, you invest in a... Yeah, and, and to understand that, what I'm about to say, you'd have to watch the last seminar. Um, but if you invest in a market that has a cap rate above 9%, um, that's a high cash flow market, which is probably depreciating, and that you're, you're, you're making up for your depreciation by getting that higher cash flow. Um, but here's the thing. Appreciation is going to happen um, in, a, in, in a halfway decent market. And in San Diego, our average rate of appreciation going back 50 years, half a century, is about 4.6, 4.7%. I often use four and a half just for a round number. Now, a lot of people, and I'll play devil's advocate against myself, a lot of people will say, but Patrick, appreciation is speculative, okay? If appreciation is speculative, me waking up tomorrow is also speculative. I could die in my sleep tonight. I live on the California coast. Me not getting hit by a tsunami today is speculative. Um, asteroids could hit us. Um, the sun rising tomorrow is speculative. Anything can happen. I agree. Um, the odds of certain things happening, though, are close to none. And the odds of real estate not being worth more than it is today, five, 10 years from now, is very, very slim. Um, again, you'd have to go over, you, you, you will never find a 10-year period in American history where it's worth less. That said, what is speculative, in my opinion, is cash flow. Anyone who argue, argues that appreciation is speculative, but cash flow is not, go talk to investors today that are not getting their rent checks from their tenants because their tenants lost their job, okay? Um, I would rather speculate on the broader economy moving forward than speculate on one or two tenants to pay my rent. There is a lot more room for error investing in one or two tenants rather than investing for a broad economy. Um, so just my little plug on speculation versus appreciation. So in San Diego, we have that average appreciation rate, as I said, four and a half percent. So on this property, it will appreciate over the long term, on average, four and a half percent, which is around $50,000 year over year. And appreciation, Vanessa, is like a snowball going downhill. That appreciation is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger every year, like compound interest because it's appreciating on the new value of the property each and every year. That's inflation, that's appreciation. So when you add up <clears throat> after a first full year, you now have cash flow of $11,000, you have principal payment of over $12,000, and you have appreciation of over $49,000. That all adds up to $73,000, almost $74,000 <clears> in this individual's net worth going up. When you divide 73,000 by that initial investment of $275,000 in cash, that is a 26.85% return on his investment. And that return continuously grows as appreciation and rents go up. So this is, this is the real number you need to look at. This is as deep as you need to get to see what's your real return on that cash you invested. And this is why I say you should get at least a 15 to 25% return on your investment, on your money. You're not gonna get a 15 to 25% cash on cash, but you should get a 15 to 25% when you include your cash flow, your principal pay down and your appreciation, and you're using a loan, leverage. Does that make sense, Vanessa? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And remember how we say <clears throat> of average fair investment, has a cap rate plus appreciation equal to nine. We said that in the last seminar. And that's K. So that <clears throat> is, so that's what he's saying is you can choose to, if you have a high cash flowing market, it's typically going to be in a low appreciation market. So right. 
if you have a cap rate of, of seven, then it's probably only going to appreciate 2%. Where if you have, um, or, or if you have a low cash uh, flowing market, like if you have a cash flow of two, uh, 4%, then you probably have a 5% appreciation. <laughs> and we have like, we have like seven or eight minutes. So would you like to, uh, and you know, we're going to continue this next week because it's such an in-depth, like breakdown type of subject. Um, would you like to give a, a simplified example of a cash flowing asset that has a, like, obviously this is one, like a really in-depth breakdown, but like, like I love your fourplex example, uh, that you just purchased in, but, or do you have a different type of like well, this? So we're, I'm going to do a magic trick for you. And I only need two minutes to do this magic trick. And I'm going to show you now how negative cash flow makes you wealthier faster. You ready okay. for this? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so on this example, on this example, we all agree we're getting a 26.85% return. Okay. Even if we had no appreciation, we're getting an 8.85. I love getting 26% returns. That's going to make you wealthier pretty darn fast. But what if you want to get wealthier or you want to get wealthier faster? Watch this magic trick. I'm going to change one thing in this entire spreadsheet. Only one thing, Vanessa. And that is my down payment. I am going to put in a 5% down payment. See, I changed nothing else. So I can guarantee you this investor is going to negative cash flow. Why? Because his mortgage payment just went up astronomically because he put down so much less. He's going to negative cash flow. In fact, let's go take a look at this. We're going to scroll all the way to the bottom to the real raw numbers. His cash flow in year one is negative 4,400. Cash flow in year two is negative 2,500. It's going to take them four years just to break even on cash flow. <clears throat> Why? In your right mind, would you invest in this negative cash flow asset with a low down payment? <clears throat> it's because. So you say per year he was, he's, he's negative 44. Yep. Negative. Yeah, he's going to negative cash flow. Um, so next operating year he's... expenses in that building outweigh like the. The rents. Well, because rent. of the mortgage. The rents stayed the same. The operating expenses stayed the same. The mortgage went up astronomically because of the lower down payment. Because he went from 25% to 5%. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. What else, what else went up though? His principal payment, okay? When you factor in that principal payment of 16000 instead of now 8000 or 9000 which it was before, you take that negative cash flow, negative 2500 plus pot is 1,600, his total return is 13,000. So now he's at 24, almost a 25% return. And we're not even talking about appreciation yet. And he's already making a 25% return. Why? Because his cash, his, his payment in it is only 55,000 bucks. It's not 250, it's only 55,000. Now, what is still happening? Appreciation. Appreciation does not care how much of a down payment you make. It's gonna appreciate no matter what it's gonna appreciate, no matter how much you put down. So it's still appreciating that 49,000, almost 50,000 a year. So when you subtract the negative cash flow and you add the principal payment and you add the appreciation, he's now making that 63,000 a year, which divided by his, his down payment of 55,000, he is making 114% return on his money. I do not know anywhere else where you can make 114% return on your money. This is how you can double your money every single year. This is how you be can become a millionaire in five to 10 years by doing low down payments, accepting negative cash flow, and doubling that money every single year. If you do it with a VA loan, check it out. You got a VA buyer. I got a VA buyer who wants to buy a fourplex. And he's like, yeah, but I'm going to negative cash flow because it's no down payment. Um, check this out. He's definitely got negative cash flow, negative eight, negative 6,000. And down here, it doesn't even give us a number because the number is infinity. And uh, infinity is not a real number. Excel can't calculate that. So it gives us an error. So I always like to just say, hey, 1% down payment. And this veteran is now getting over a 500% return on their money. That's insane. How do I know this works? I've done it. I've done it. Dozens of times myself. I mean, you have to be able clients. to shoulder. You have to be able to shoulder eight thousand dollars negative cash flow. Like not everybody can do that. Let's but, put in that five percent again. Most people, I will argue, Vanessa, 
most people can argue uh, can handle negative five thousand a year, a year cash a year. flow. Okay, okay, that's if you that. don't, it, it, um, when I was in my twenties, I'd go to the bars, I'd go to the restaurants, spend money. Get ri it's a car payment. Look, it's three hundred and seventy-four dollars a month. Oh, it's a car bad. payment. Got it. It's a it, it's the same payment as an IRA. If you can put forty-four hundred into your IRA this year, and that's negative cash flow, you can put it into a piece of property, and that IRA is not going to give you 114% return. That 401k is not going to give you 114% return. But oh. putting that money into your real estate will give you 100% plus return. Ah! Well, I hope everybody's mind is blown right now because that is exciting actually to just look at this from such a different perspective and even to see how doable it is when you think about your negative you know, $5,000 a year um well and uh we're gonna cut off right now so really quick what are we gonna focus on next week next week i recommend we spend the first five or ten minutes uh rehashing this at least the bottom portion here um okay. and, and just really Understood. drive in what this does for you um and then we'll we'll also break it down for the home buyer because right now we talked a lot about the investor we're, we'll break it down for just as a detached single family or condo home buyer next week as well that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Gosh, thank you so much for your brain and your time and all the years you spent learning this so you can break it down for us. Um, Michelle, you can see the webinar again. We have a lot of thank yous. Um, uh, we can see the webinar again uh, if, on the replay on LCA. We're going to stream it in a, in, a, in a live or in a repeated video. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Vanessa. Thank you so much. Everybody's super happy. You're welcome, guys. Yeah.